Panorama TV presents How They Do That, where we explore the world of professional photographers and share their techniques with you. Here's your host, Mark Wallace. Hi everybody, welcome to this week's episode of How They Do That. I'm Mark Wallace. Well, on today's show we have David Bergman. He's an action photographer and video producer based in New York. He began as a staff photographer for the Miami Herald and then worked for Sports Illustrated. He became a freelance photographer in 2001 and now focuses on tour photography and band portraits. He created tourphotographer.com and he's currently shooting the Bon Jovi Live Tour 2011. So thanks so much for joining us today, David. Hey Mark, how are you? Good, thanks for having me. Well, I'm great. I know we're pressured a little bit for time, so I want to dive right in. Before we get to Bon Jovi, I know that you have taken pictures of a much more famous and influential person on at least two occasions, and I'm speaking, of course, of President Barack Obama. You shot his presidential inauguration as well as a ceremonial first pitch. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the inauguration. Um, tell us how you shot that. I've heard rumors that you shot that with a point and shoot camera. Is that true? And tell us a little bit more. That is true. I did use a point and shoot camera. In addition to my regular gear, I was covering the inauguration for my agency at the time and was shooting traditional journalism, journalistic photos that I was doing for the agency. And at the same time, while I was doing that with my long lenses, I also set up a unit called a Gigapan. And I, what it does is it allows me to shoot a panoramic photo of the entire scene by shooting a number of different images basically in a grid pattern side by side and then up and down and uh, it allows it covers the whole field and there were two million people at this event and I just thought it was going to be important to shoot as much of it as I could in one photo so by using this gigapan unit with a point and shoot camera I shot 220 individual photos uh, and then stitched them all together in the computer afterward and turned it into one giant photo and the, the net result is it looks like a single image of the scene but then it's kind of like Google Maps where you can zoom in and really see fine detail you can pick out individual people in the crowd and that thing I put it up on my blog not really thinking anything of it and to date it's got 14 or 15 million views and it, it kind of took off and had a life of its own so that picture um, since then I've used that Gigapan unit for for many many other big events like the Final Four and the Super Bowl and a bunch of concerts and so it, it's been a fun uh, little toy to play around with. Yeah, it, I've, I've played around with that shot and it is a fun uh, little experience to go and look at the inauguration for those of us who couldn't actually be there. Well, let's talk a little bit about what is in your normal gear bag. Um, talk to us about the gear that you're taking with you on the road uh, on a normal shoot. Yeah, so the gear that I use changes depending on what I'm shooting, but for the most part, my go-to kit, I'm a Nikon shooter, so I'm shooting with Nikon D3s or D3Ss, and I, I'm mostly using zoom lenses. Uh, my, my, my three lens setup is mostly the 14 to 24 2.8 and the 24 70 2.8 and the 70 to 200 2.8. So that way I've got the entire range from 14 millimeters all the way to 200 millimeters. The D3 series is a full frame camera. So that 14 millimeters is a true 14 millimeter. It's very wide. It's, you have to be very careful when you use that lens, but I can go all the way from 14 to 200. Um, I'm starting to play around with more prime lenses. I actually just came from Adorama. I picked up a, the 24 1.4, which is still in the box right next to me, and I'm, I'm pretty excited to play with that a little bit later today. Well, let's talk about what your normal week looks like. So what does a normal David Bergman week look like with all your travel and shooting? Well, there's really no normal week. Every, every week's kind of different. It basically depends on what emails or phone calls I get on any given day. Uh, something will come in and I might be on a plane the next day or uh, you know, I might be at home working on invoices and marketing and all that other stuff that, uh, that comes up when I'm in the office. And, uh, but a, a traditional week, I'll usually wind up shooting anywhere from two to five days on any given week. And then the rest of the time when I'm not with my, trying to spend time with my family who doesn't get to see me as much as they'd like, um, I am doing all that other stuff in the office, the marketing and the invoices. Um, that changes a little bit when I'm on tour. I do occasionally go out on tour. Right now I'm actually in the middle of the Bon Jovi tour, as you mentioned. And obviously I'm on the road full time when that happens, all across the country, all across the world. And uh, it, it can be tough because I often don't have time to take care of some of those other things that need to get done. But uh, at the same time, it, it's, it's an unbelievable gig. So that being out on the road on tour with a, with a band of that caliber it can't be beat. So, so every week is different. I never really know what to expect. And that, that's kind of the fun of, uh, of this job is it's just get to meet all kinds of interesting people and you're in a different place every day. 
Yeah, I mean, it just has to be an amazing adventure, and it's, it's great that we can sort of follow along on your blog and uh, tourphotographer.com and see what you're doing. It's, it's really nice. Well, speaking of shooting live events, we get a lot of email and questions from people who want to shoot, not Bon Jovi, but uh, local bands or dance recitals, things that are similar to what you're shooting. So can you share with us a little uh, of your strategies for shooting in these very difficult lighting situations? How do you meter? What settings are you using? What kind of lenses are you using? And can people shoot with a point and shoot camera and get similar results with what you're getting? Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly is more challenging with a point and shoot camera when, when the light is low. Uh, Obviously, with better equipment, it's going to make things a little bit easier. The, the main things that, that more expensive equipment will help you with is the low light sensitivity of a camera like the D3 or the D3S especially is off the charts. So I can shoot in, in almost near you know, total darkness. I, I've shot things that I can't even see you know, with my naked eye, but yet I can make pictures at that time with those cameras. So that certainly helps. Also, lenses with very big apertures, 2.8 you know, 2.0, 1.8, 1.4, big, big, wide lenses. Uh, when the apertures can open all the way up, that's gonna help you, no doubt, uh, shoot in low light. The main thing is, is just to make sure you meter correctly because if you're shooting a wide scene and the very small area in the middle is brightly lit with a spotlight and the rest of the area is very dark, the camera's gonna be a little confused because it's gonna try to average out that scene, not understanding that the dark part should be dark and the, the brightest part should be normal. So what you want to do is make sure you use your maybe the spot meter on your camera or some kind of a meter where you can get in really tight and just figure out what the light is in that middle area that's the brightest and set your camera on manual for that setting and then let the rest of the scene go dark and don't worry about the rest of it. That's the, big, the biggest problem people make is they just use these auto settings and the camera doesn't understand you know what should be lit properly and what shouldn't. So it's kind of up to you to figure out what the, what the light should be, what the reading should be in your camera, and then set it manually, leave it that way for the rest of the night, and you should be golden at that point. Well, are you also using image-stabilized lenses, VR lenses on your cameras? I do have uh, uh, IS lenses, or the VR lenses. Uh, you know, that, to be honest with you, the VR doesn't help me that much because most of the things I'm shooting are very fast, and I'm shooting at fast shutter speeds, 500th of a second, 1,000th of a second, and the, the, the uh, image stabilization doesn't really have that much of an effect at that point. The thing that it's good for is if I'm shooting something maybe like panning along with a race car or a runner or something like that, and I'm shooting at a 30th of a second, something a little bit slower, then the, the image stabilization really helps to, to stabilize that lens so you don't get a lot of uh, uh, shake from that. But most of the stuff I'm shooting at very fast shutter speeds uh, it's not really much of an issue. Well, you shoot a lot of photos and you're on the go constantly. So how do you archive your photos and make sure that you can pull those out later, uh, keywording those kinds of uh, issues? How do you uh, do all your digital asset management? It's interesting. Archiving is one of those things that people don't think a lot about. And, and with the era that we're in of digital photography, people have no problem shooting thousands of photos and then they have no idea what to do with them. So it's something I do spend a lot of time dealing with. Um, I use Aperture. Uh, it's Apple's uh, asset management program. I love it. I've used it since the beginning. And uh, I do find it to be a really good way to keep track of my images and where they are. I also buy many, many external hard drives. On a typical Bon Jovi concert, I might shoot between four and 5,000 images. These are all raw files, so they're huge. I easily go through the last, let's see, the last two months I was on the road, I filled a two terabyte hard drive. So it's a lot of files. It's a lot of... Uh, asset management, if you want to call it that, moving images around, making sure everything is that I can find it. So I do use Aperture to handle all my keywords and my captioning so that when I need to find something later, uh, it, it'll tell me exactly where it is and everything goes on external hard drives. I carry them with me. I, I have two copies of everything with me on the road that I, <laughs> I, I duplicate everything because if one of those drives dies, I'm in big trouble. So. Uh, I've got two copies and a third copy of my best images that I store in the cloud online using a, using a service. So uh, everything's backed up in multiple places. If, you know, even both my hard drives were to die, I would still have my best images available to me. So, uh, yeah, asset management is a, is, a, is a huge issue that most people don't think about. Well, uh, and I'm just curious if you have any kind of an assistant uh, helping you out with all this stuff because you've got lots of stuff back home that has to do with the business and then you've got gear and digital asset management and it's a lot of stuff to do in addition to shooting. 
Are you a one-man band or do you have other people helping you out? You know, I'm mostly a one-man band. I do hire assistants uh, for shoots usually. Um, I don't have somebody in the office, although I've, I've had my regular, you know, photo assistants go in and handle things for me when they need to get done. But uh, for the most part, I've been doing this on my own for 20 years and uh, so far it's worked out. Well, let's talk a little bit about your post-processing. Do you find that you have to do a lot of post-processing or is it minimal with uh, the shots that you're taking uh, specifically um, for, for live bands? Yeah, all the live stuff I shoot, the sports and the band uh, concert things that I shoot, I do very little post-processing. Just basic things we've always done, you know, color correction, basic levels and toning. It's very easy to do an aperture. I can just, you know, copy all my settings over to multiple images, white balance, things like that. So I try to do as little as possible, mostly because it just would take me forever. The, the, the types of images that I do really go in and work on are the portraits, uh, especially the band portraits. I'll, I'll bring those into Photoshop and really work on them quite a bit so that they, they pop a little bit more. And some of the, the edgier magazines that I work for like that style. So, um, but 99% of my work, I, I try to do as little as possible just, just because I wouldn't be able to keep up with it all. You've got some just amazing shots of uh, Bon Jovi doing some, you know, these, these shows. It seems like everything's just happening very spontaneously. Do you find that your background as a sports photographer helps with your tour photography? The interesting thing is concert photography, I have found, is very similar to sports photography. You're dealing with uh, changing light conditions. You're dealing with unexpected movement and, you know, everything is just happening very quickly. And you, you just have to react. It's a lot of hand-eye coordination and anticipation. So the good thing is when I work with a band over and over like Bon Jovi, it's great because I have learned their tendencies over the years. I have a good idea of what they might do. They do surprise me sometimes, but I've seen the show enough and I, I've seen these guys work the stage. So I, I, I have a, I try my best to anticipate what's going to happen. But at the same time, just when I I'm getting confident and I feel like I know what's going to happen, then they throw something at me that, that changes everything. So that's, that's kind of the fun part when, uh, when something changes and something unexpected happens. So uh, it's, it, it, you know, the familiarity helps, but you've got to be ready for, for anything. Well, do you find that uh, going back into the studio when you're shooting something that's a little bit less hectic and you can control the lighting, do you find that refreshing or do you find it uh, limiting because you don't have all of the, the activity that you're normally used to on the road? Uh, do you prefer one over the other or are they both equally satisfying for you? I think I do prefer uh, the, the live environment where there's a lot of stuff happening, but certainly over the years I have developed my portrait style and the, the way I like to shoot portraits is I, I, I almost treat it like an event where I will set up the lighting and set up the environment so that the artist or whoever I'm shooting is the subject is comfortable and then once that's in place I, I do everything I can to get them engaged and to get them moving and to get them doing things and that way it's almost like the best of both worlds. I've, I've created the parameters so I know where they're going to be and, and, and in what scenario they're in but at the same time then I let them be free and I, and I, and I can just sort of capture what's happening. So, so my lighting style influences that a little bit too. I have to light a little more broadly. I, I can't, you know, I'm not telling somebody move your chin one inch to the left because it's too restrictive. So I kind of light broader areas and then just let, let the scene happen. So I, I, I kind of bring the best of both worlds into it. Tell us a little bit about tourphotographer.com and what people can find there. It's, it's a very fascinating site, but for people that haven't been there, Talk to us a little bit about it. Yeah, so I started tourphotographer.com about five years ago. My, my real goal uh, is to bring back the artistry of tour photography. I just feel like bands have kind of lost the, I don't know, initiative to hire photographers and document what's happening in their world, especially when they're on the way up and even when they're all the way at the top. Uh, that I feel like that art is dying. and. Uh, so I, I feel like I can bring a journalistic look to that uh, world and bring my talents to it and document for bands everything that's going on. So I created tourphotographer.com and, and basically make my pictures available for people to buy as prints. So the idea is you go to a show, you get home either that night or the next day or within a couple of days. You can then go online and see a nice gallery of 12, 20, 30 images from the show you attended and buy an 8x10, 11x14, nice print that you can hang on your wall and look at forever to remember that day. So uh, for me, it was just a, a roundabout way to continue to be able to do the kind of work that I love to do. And at the same time, what I want to do is build the site up enough and the company up enough so that 
I want to have 50 bands out on the road with 50 photographers working for me and have it all documented and just I want people to think when they go to a show to come home and go on tourphotographer.com and see some great images from that show. We're not just putting out 100 frames of the guy standing there with a mic. You know, these are all well crafted, well uh, well photographed images so and printed properly and and you know just ready to be hung and framed on a wall so that's my goal uh, you know I'm in the early stages of it but it's going well so far and and we'll see where it goes I know that you've got to get to your next gig so thank you so much for joining me today thanks Mark I really appreciate you having me on you bet well to see more of David's work please check out davidbergman.net or tour, tourphotographer.com and if you have someone that you'd like to see on how they do that please send me your request at askmark at adorama.com I'm Mark Wallace thanks again for joining me I'll see you again next week this episode is brought to you by Adorama TV. Visit the Adorama Learning Center where you'll find photography tips and techniques, links to the gear used in this episode, and related videos. For all the latest photography, video, and computer gear, visit Adorama.com. And the next time you're in New York City, visit our store located on 18th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue.